Hello, hello, hello. I am Brian Goulet of the Goulet Pen Company, and you are here watching episode 20 of Goulet Q&A. 20 of these things, I can't believe it's been that long. Can't believe you've listened to me just sit here and talk in your face with not much visual attraction. No one else is on the uh, Q&A here. It's pretty much just me, so I'm really kind of just impressed that you're sitting here watching this week after week. That's kind of cool. Uh, this is January 31st of 2014, and the theme for this week is pen maintenance. Now, I got a lot, a lot of great questions. I'm really sorry I'm not going to be able to go fully in depth on everybody's questions. I had to leave a lot of them out. It's just getting to the point where I'm getting so many questions, I can't answer them, like not even half of them, you know. So I got probably, I don't know, 40 or 50 questions this time between, you know, Red and Facebook and Inc. Nouveau and Twitter and, and all these different things. And, you know, that's really awesome. I'm really glad you guys keep asking questions. The more questions you ask, the better and more comprehensive answers that I can give. Uh, and, you know, I got a lot of questions that kind of overlapped a little bit. So it'll actually help some more questions I get. I can kind of lump things together and, and cover more stuff. So that said, don't have a ton of time. Uh, to cover everything, but I will be able to cover a lot of good stuff. So I'm just kind of going to jump right into it. First question I have is from Junie L on Facebook. How often should I regrease a piston filler pen? Uh, and this was a question I got a lot. I got a ton of questions about silicone grease. So this is actually a really good thing for me to uh, kind of cover. So uh, yes, piston filling pen. You know, it's really going to depend. It's not going to be often. It's not like every time you clean or ink the pen, you got to regrease it. It's, it's really actually going to be pretty seldom. It's going to vary by pen, depending on the quality of the seal that's inside the pen. Um, for those of you not familiar with the piston pen, that's basically where the, the filling mechanism is built into the pen and the actual the body of the pen is, is the wall of the ink chamber. So it has a piston that's kind of built into the pen and you you know, twist the back of it or whatever, and it moves up and down. Um, so there's going to be a rubber seal in there of some kind, uh, most likely rubber. And uh, over time, the grease is going to break down or it's going to kind of wear away and you want to grease it up. Really, you just kind of use it, um, you just use your own judgment. So if, if it feels a little tough, then go ahead and grease it up. If it's operating just fine, then it's just fine. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, me personally, you know, if it's a pen like a uh, Twisby or um, I'm trying to think of it, like a Noodler's pen maybe where you can actually take out the piston mechanism and clean it out and you know sometimes I'll have a, a ink that I really need to clean thoroughly and I'll use a Q-tip and stuff like that. Then I'm actually kind of accelerating the process of getting the silicone grease off the piston because um, anytime you're mechanically cleaning it as opposed to just chemically, uh, you're kind of removing that silicone grease. So then I would grease it back up, stick it back in. But if you've already got the mechanism out, it's like, what's the big deal? You just kind of go, go at it again. But if you've got a pen where it's like a Lamy 2000 or something that is not easily disassembled, you know, some of the Pelican pens, um, it's not often that you're going to need to do it. Just, you know, really maybe once a month at a minimum, but in probably six months, 12 months maybe. It really depends on how much you use it. Um, and it's also going to depend if you are um, using the same ink over and over again and, you know, how, what your cleaning regimen is like. Because with a piston pen, you know, you're actually using the mechanism to flush and fill the pen during the cleaning process. So if you're changing ink every time, then you're cleaning and, and using that piston a lot more than you would be if you were just using one continuous color in it. So that's why there's kind of such a wide range of how often it might need to be greased. It all depends on how much you're using that piston. All right, um, and you know, there's a lot of other uses for silicone grease as well. I got a lot of just kind of random questions about silicone grease, um, but uh, you know, if you're using an eyedropper pen, for example, I know this question was asking about piston fillers, but a lot of people have eyedroppers too. If you got silicone grease on the threads of your eyedropper pen, that you're gonna wanna do every time you fill the pen. Doesn't matter about the color, doesn't matter about the cleaning. Every time you open up the body of that pen, you're gonna wanna regrease it to make sure that seal is tight. So, wanted to just point that out. And the, since there's so many questions about silicone grease, uh, I'm kind of thinking like, do I need to shoot a silicone grease video? Like maybe a video that's just about all the different uses for silicone grease, how often you need to do it, how to properly go about it. I know I've used it in, in certain um, videos that I've done about, you know, the, the Noodler's Conrad or whatever and the Twisby pens and stuff, or I've used silicone grease in the videos, but I don't think I've ever done a silicone grease specific video. So that's I'm open to doing that. If you have other questions about silicone grease, that would be really good. Maybe I'll solicit questions specifically about that for a video in the future. And then one more thing to point out about silicone grease, um, thanks to Tom who sent me an email. 
he wanted to point out that you want to keep the silicone grease away from your nib. Okay, so if you're using silicone grease, especially if you're using your finger to spread it, and then you still have it on your finger and you go to touch your nib or adjust your nib at all, if you get any of that silicone grease in the slit of your nib, you're going to break the ink flow and it's going to cause you some problems. But because silicone grease is clear and you really can't see it in the, sl in the slit of that nib, then you could be creating some problems for yourself and you may never even know why. So that's one thing. Think back if you have any flow issues. Did I possibly get any silicone grease on that nib? Something to point out there. Tan Yi's on YouTube said, do you have any experience removing scratches on plastic or resin pens? How do you go about doing it? Okay, so I'm not a master pen restorer, but in the early days of Goulet Pen Company, I was making pens, turning them myself, using acrylics all day long, so I know how to polish them acrylics, okay? If you've got a really aggressive scratch, you can go with this stuff called Micromesh, okay? You may be familiar with Micromesh for some of the nib smoothing video type stuff that I've done. I have a video specifically on how to smooth a nib with Micromesh. Um, these are little pads of Micromesh. These are what I actually used back when I was making pens because it was very convenient to hold while I was spinning on the lathe. Um, there's different grits that you can get. Um, this particular one you buy in a set. I don't sell these, so you have find them somewhere. But you really don't want to go that aggressive because um, it's uh, you can do some damage and you want to make sure not to touch any of the metal parts of your pen if you're using any of this stuff. Don't touch metal, okay? It's going to wear away the metal. Most of the metal that you're getting these days on pens is plated. So if you got a gold, it's going to be a gold plating on top of brass or chrome or something like that. And so you are going to want to make sure that you keep this stuff away from any kind of metal. So I just want to point that out. Uh, but this, this stuff works really well depending on how deep the scratch is. might depend on how aggressive you need to go in your approach here. This is kind of, it's a, it's a type of sandpaper, but it's a super, super fine sandpaper. You don't ever want to take actual sandpaper to your pen because that's going to be way too aggressive. Um, this stuff is 1500 grit up through 12,000. And that's kind of like a micro mesh land um, grit size. It's not actually the same as like a sandpaper grit, but still, whatever. I mean, 12,000 is pretty, pretty darn fine. It almost feels like leather. It's so, um, such a fine abrasive. Um, so that's one way you can go. But the stuff that I've used, it works really well. Um, this stuff, it's, this is just one brand. I have no affiliation with this brand, except this is the bottle that I used back when I was turning pens. And you can see how much of it I use. So this stuff lasts forever. Um, Hut Ultra Gloss class Plastic Polish. No affiliation with this brand. You can go with any type, but you want to go with a plastic polish. And this stuff is kind of the same concept as the Micro Mesh, except it's a polishing compound instead of being a you know physical abrasive on a pad. So, but it's going to be the same kind of abrasive that you're going to get in both of these. Um, this stuff works really, really well. I just have like. <laughs> This, I like pulled out all my old pen making stuff here. So I had all these little just cotton strips. So if you have like an old cotton t-shirt or something, you know, just use that. Honestly though, a paper towel works just fine if you're just doing a pen here and there. But um, so use that, throw a little bit of polish on there and then you just kind of rub it and, and it'll get out fine scratches. Any deeper stuff you need to go with something like a micro mesh. Um, another good thing you can use, and I don't have it with me, but um, use a jeweler's cloth. So a jeweler's cloth is basically a cloth with an abrasive kind of built into it. And usually they'll be kind of two-sided. So it's like a little more aggressive, a little finer. Um, they're, they're still pretty fine in the grand scheme of things. It's going to be more like kind of using a plastic polish like this as opposed to a micro mesh. Um, but those were great. You can get them just about any jewelry store or any place that sells any kind of jewelry. And they're pretty cheap, it's like eight bucks or something. I don't sell those, but not thought about it, but you know, that would be the way to go. Uh, Wesley S on Facebook, you said, what are some tr good troubleshooting tips for pen problems during the workday? Sometimes my pen will dry up or feed poorly into the nib while I'm working and it's difficult to get it right again. That is frustrating, I know, because I work and I use pens a lot. Uh, and sometimes that gets really frustrating. So there's a lot of different reasons that could happen. I can't really give you a diagnosis without, you know, knowing exactly what you have going on. So the first piece of advice I have is to keep several pens on you, okay? Always have a backup so that if you're in the middle of a meeting or something like that, you just change it out, whip out another pen. Uh, you know, honestly, I carry multiple pens with me everywhere I go anyway, just because People are so impressed that I'm using a fountain pen, they really just have a bunch of questions and I'd like to have a couple different types of pens just to show them anyway because I'm pretty much gonna be whipping them out as a demonstration 
Anyway, so I like to keep a couple different ones, but for me personally, if I'm on the go, I may or may not have a pen filled. I honestly, sometimes I bring pens that are completely empty and I just have forgotten to check them before I leave. It happens. So I always have a couple of backups just in case. I, in my laptop case, I have like three or four different pens inked up at any one time. I may keep a couple on my person, uh, a couple in my like little notepad or something, my traveler's notebook that I'll carry around. So that'd be the first thing, keep, keep some backups, okay? And then you can kind of diagnose the problem later once you're not in the heat of battle in your aggressive, you know, go-getter workday. Um, uh, keep proper pen maintenance. That is definitely the key. You know, sometimes you're dealing with work, especially with paper at work. You know, if you're here in the U.S. especially, a lot of the inkjet, like copier paper, is pretty terrible and uh, will kind of scratch up easily and get, you'll get paper fibers that'll go into the slit of your nib. That stuff gets in there, junks up, builds up into your pen. So keeping a proper cleaning regimen is great. Check out my Fountain Pen 101 uh, pen cleaning and maintenance video for more information on that. But you want to clean your pen at least once a month uh, if you're using the same ink or between every color change that you're doing. Next thing you might want to do is try using different inks. Sometimes some inks just don't really like to play nicely with your pens. So try switching them up. Maybe you'll have better luck with a different ink. Uh, and then last thing is don't use repeat offender pens. So if you've got one pen that the dang thing just doesn't seem to want to cooperate, just stop using that pen at work. You know, I hate to tell, I'm not going to tell you to like go out and buy more pens. Most people who get into this hobby end up doing that on their own anyway. So I don't even have to recommend it, but you're going to get interested in the hobby and want to use it anyway. But uh, so yeah, just, you know, if you have a pen that you really like using, but it just gives you too much trouble uh, during the day, you know, use that pen at home when you have time to fiddle with it and whatnot, and then stick with, you know, the more reliable ones when you're at work. All right. At Supermassive on Twitter said, how many times can you syringe refill a cartridge? Uh, and how do you know it's time to use a new one? So there's no like set rule on this. Different cartridges from different brands will have uh, kind of different durability, I guess. Your typical standard international cartridge, you know, five to 10 times is probably gonna be about your max um, because the things are really just not made to hold up that long. They're made to be disposable. So you're refilling them and stuff and that's cool, but eventually popping them on and off like that, it's gonna kind of wear down. They're gonna crack and break and stuff like that. So pretty much once it doesn't fit tightly and once it starts leaking and breaking apart, that's when you know you need a new one. Uh, uh, there's really no clear thing that I can tell you as to when it's time, except for when it just doesn't work anymore. Louise M on Facebook <coughs> said, or Louis, Louis M, I purchased my Goulet Lamy Safari around six months ago. That's just a Lamy Safari from me. There's no special Goulet Lamy Safari. So thank you. Cool. Uh, sorry if I butchered your name there, but I appreciate the shout out there. Uh, okay, so anyway. I uh, got my Lamy Safari around six months ago. I use a converter. I write a lot in college and usually ink it up twice a week. Okay? I've noticed the flow has more resistance than when I first got it. I've never cleaned it or done anything to it. Should I clean it? How do I clean it? I didn't know fountain pens needed cleaning. Well, they do. Clean it. Definitely clean it. That's your problem pretty much right there, I can tell you. Unless you dropped it or something which, you know, affected it somehow. But pretty much you need to clean it. I'm willing to bet that's your problem. Uh, so like I said just a few minutes ago, you definitely want to check out my Fountain Pen 101 video on pen cleaning and maintenance. You can watch that. I'm about 65 pounds heavier. I look like a different person, but the information is still good in there. Uh, so definitely check that one out. It'll tell you everything you need to know, but to kind of summarize it, you want to clean your pen every time that you're changing ink colors. You're going to want to clean your pen at least once a month if you're using the same color. Uh, and the reason for that is you get paper fibers, you get dust that attracts from the air because your nib is actually, it's metal, so it's attracting actually a static charge as you're writing on the paper because it's creating friction. Dust from the air will be attracted to the nib. Um, and then if you have, you know, that you a periods of time where you're not using it as much, the ink may start to dry out a little bit and you'll get ink that'll kind of cake up in there. The dried up, caked up ink will catch into the paper fibers and dust that builds up in the pen. And so this is why you want to clean and maintain it regularly, which you can just use regular distilled water or just regular tap water, you know, if you don't have distilled water handy, um, or a pen flush if you find that it needs that. So check that out. At Drew Design on Twitter said, any tips for keeping nibs free of extra ink? Every time I wipe it with a paper towel or tissue, it just draws out ink. 
Well, yes. Um, ink works by capillary action and paper towel is very absorbent. So when you're touching a paper towel to the slit or the feed or the tip of the nib, it's going to just blast ink out of there forever until the ink is completely dry out of the pen. So you're never really going to be able to stop that if you're touching any of that part of the nib. Um, and if you're thinking, I, I think what you're talking about here is nib creep. Okay, nib creep is where the ink will kind of work its way up because it's working by capillary action, it'll work its way up through the slit of the nib and kind of come out onto the surface of the nib. And if you're trying to wipe that away over top of the slit, well, basically every time you're touching the paper to the slit of the nib, you're just drawing out more ink. So certain inks are gonna be worse than others. Certain pens will be worse than others. You just try to be really careful about how you wipe it away. Maybe you try a Q-tip or something. That way you can kind of get as close to the slit as you can. But honestly, Nib creep is a fact of life for a lot of pen and ink combinations. I personally have just embraced it. I don't even sweat nib creep at all. Some people are really bothered by it, so you're gonna you're gonna f wrestle around a while trying to take care and eliminate nib creep in your life entirely. But that's what's going on. Tristan N on Facebook. What is the easiest way to clean the threads on a pen? You wrote treads, but I'm thinking you mean threads, unless you got some kind of sweet you know, all-terrain pen that you're talking about there. So the threads that hold the cap on will over time accumulate dirt. Now I use a toothpick or a stiff piece of paper, but I can't imagine this is the easiest way to do so. So you have got to use some Q-tips, okay? This Q-tips are like one of the most versatile and ingenious tools for cleaning out pen parts. Uh, I use Q-tips all the time, all the time, not just for ink swabs and stuff, but for actually cleaning the pen. And this is a perfect, perfect time to use it because the q-tip is cotton it's kind of squishy and you can just kind of get in those threads and it works really really well um, you can wet the q-tip with water or if you want with pen flush and that really helps to clean it out well so q-tips are your answer tristan okay uh, g4bbr on reddit uh, what is the most maintenance free pen you sell or have ever tried uh, so there's a lot of pens that are pretty, pretty low key. So I like the Lamy 2000, that one's good. It's got a hooded nib. I just almost never really have to do anything with it except just regular cleaning and maintenance. You're never really gonna get a maintenance free pen because it's just a fact of life. It's like having a maintenance free car. Yeah, okay, some cars are more maintenance free than others, but it's a physical object. We live in a physical world. It's, if you're using it, it's gonna need to be maintained. Just embrace that. Um, but some are better than others. So really you want something that is not going to dry out. That seems to be kind of mainly the problem with fountain pens. If you have things where the pen isn't sealed up properly and stuff, that water will dry up and the ink will dry inside the pen. And there you go. So pens that are better at sealing the nib inside the pen are where you tend to have the least amount of problems. Of course, there's other aspects, quality aspects of the pen that over time may be more of an issue, but that's the big one. Um, so that, keeping that in mind, the one I've actually had the least problems with is the Platinum 3776 Century pens. So Platinum, as of uh, a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, came out with this Century line of their 3776, um, which, interesting little fact, the 3776 is the height of the tallest mountain in Japan, Mount Fuji, I believe, I want to say, um, 3776 meters high. That's why it's called 3776. Didn't know that before, except I watched a video that I recently found, and shoot, I'm telling you this cool video, and I'm, I can't recall it, but it's a video that was done by Platinum that explains the 3776 and the logic behind, and the science behind their um, slip and seal cap mechanism that they have on their Century pens. So it's a, it's a mechanism that you know seals the nib into the cap, and they tout that it will keep your pen uh, wet, keep your nib wet, for over a year, up to two years, with absolutely minimal evaporation. So, pretty high claims, um, but I gotta say, I, I don't have to worry about those pens at all. I've got a couple of them you get. Um, they've got the Black Centuries, the Bourgogna is one, the Chartres Blue, that's another one. Um, they've got a couple different models out there in that 3776 line. So that, and they just came out with the music nib in that slip and seal century thing. So they kind of redesigned the nib and the whole way that it fits in there uh, and, and spent a good amount of time and money you know, switching over like that, but definitely works. Uh, kind of following up with that, Mr. Mojor Singhi on Reddit said, how about the pen that's most finicky? 
and that I have to kind of laugh a little bit because you know there's a bunch of finicky pens out there, and and I, I I haven't used every pen out there, so I can't say what is the most finicky. But the one that I definitely spend the most time talking to people about is our beloved Noodler's Flex Pens. They are great pens. They are incredible value. They do some really awesome stuff. But man, we get a lot of questions about them because some people just have no idea what they're getting into when they pick up one of these Noodler's Flex Pens. Part of it is, you know, they're inexpensive pens. There's a little bit of cleaning and tweaking and adjusting and stuff like that that you need to do. You know, they're not these um, pens that are kind of like assembled and fixed in place and everything is meant to be stay still, you're, you can take everything out, you can take the whole thing apart, which is great if you know what you're doing. But some people don't know what they're doing and they end up getting themselves into trouble. So that is one of the one more finicky ones. And because it's a flex pen, you know, it's got an ebonite feed, you can adjust the flow, you can pull out the nib and feed and adjust it to get it wetter or drier or fix things. And so that tends to be one that you play with a whole lot more than others. Uh, so that one definitely takes the cake there. Uh, look at my camels on Reddit. Cool name. <laughs> How often should I be cleaning my pens and doing sort of a total cleaning if I like to swap out my inks constantly? I feel like I'm emptying or filling a pen just about every day or every other day because I want a certain color with a certain nib. Right now I use water and just flush it until clear and then dry with a paper towel and load up my new color. But how often should I be cleaning with soap and or ammonia and then taking everything apart and adding more silicone grease, etc.? So I kind of already covered the silicone grease thing. If you're physically touching, you know, the, the piston seal as you're taking apart a pen or some kind of whatever the seal is inside your converter or something, if you're physically kind of swabbing that out, you're going to want to grease it a little more often. But really, you don't have to worry about that for a while. So switching inks a lot and cleaning it out a lot is really not affecting the silicone grease very much at all. Um, using uh, some kind of ammonia or dish soap or whatever that you might use to, you know, pen flush, uh, any of those types of cleaning type products for your ink. Uh, that you only need to do kind of as you feel it. So if you're having some kind of flow issue, if you leave it sitting in your pen for a while and it kind of dries up and cakes up, if you've got an ink that's kind of stubborn and you want to clean it, and just really if you just kind of feel like it needs to be done, you don't need to do that in between every single cleaning. But there's definitely some inks, you know, if you're using a, a black or a dark blue and you're going to a yellow, you know, if, if the yellow is gonna mix in there, it's gonna be pretty obvious. So you may wanna go a little more thorough depending on the ink that you're using. But really, this is all just kinda of up to you, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, so just, just cleaning with regular water in between most of your pen flushings is perfectly fine. And that's, that's all you're gonna need. But you know, it's kinda of when you're going to those really drastic colors or if you're using you know, an ink that's a little more extreme in its properties, you may wanna flush it after you've done that. Um, Chad T on Facebook. So best way to clean a piston filler, assuming it doesn't disassemble like a Twisby. So that's, that's a good question. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the pistons and all that kind of stuff and regreasing it. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, just cleaning the pen out, um, especially if you're like me, I'm a serial ink sampler. I change colors a lot. Um, piston pens get kind of annoying when, it, when you're doing that. I personally like using cartridge converter pens for changing out the colors constantly. And some of my favorite ones are the Lamy pens. You know, I have Lamy All-Stars and, and Safaris that I switch out a lot, not only because it's easy to take the converter out and kind of clean that, use a bulb syringe to flush out the front of the pen, great. But then you can swap nibs too. So sometimes I'll get bored with the nib or I'll be trying an ink and I'll be like, ah, I don't really like how this looks in a fine. Let me try it in a 1.1. Bam, bam, right there. Don't even have to clean out the pen or anything. You can change nibs whole new writing experience, right? So that's why I like those types of pens. But you're talking about a piston filler. So piston fillers, typically you're talking about, you have a high ink capacity. So you, I, I believe you're probably less likely, or at least I know I'm less inclined to use a piston filling pen for changing colors a lot. You know, because you got a bigger ink capacity. Me personally, I only fill my cartridge converter pens halfway sometimes because I know I'm going to want to change the color like the next day. And I'm just not going to use a whole converter in a single day. So I will only fill it halfway. So a piston pen to me is just like way more ink capacity than I need. Not to say I don't use piston pens at all, uh, but those I tend to not change colors in quite as often. So for me, my pen cleaning routine for a piston pen ends up being more of a, I'm using the same ink and I'm just gonna, you know, after a couple of weeks or a month or whatever, I will just, in between fillings, I'll just, you know, 
fill and flush some clean water and then you know paper towel on the nib to kind of draw the excess water out and then just go and fill it back up with the same ink and I don't do it real thorough cleaning okay so um, if you've got a pen like a Lummi or a, sorry like a Twisby or a Pelican that can that can some of the Pelicans um, you can actually pull the mechanism out of the back those are great because then you've essentially got the same concept as what you have with a cartridge converter. You've got the nib, you've got the body of the pen, and you can just take a bulb syringe and blast that thing. And that works out really great. Um, some of the vacuum filling pens too, like the Twisby Vac 700, Palette Custom 823, those you can take the mechanism out too and flush those things. Those were great. But if you've got a pen that doesn't disassemble, which is getting back to your question, Chad, I promise I'm not ignoring you, uh, then you're talking like a Lamy 2000 or some of the like the Pelican M200s. They don't disassemble easily. Those ones, there's really no like magic solution. You pretty much just got to do the work. So you're, you've got the mechanism that's built into the pen. It's a blessing and a curse. The curse part comes when you go to clean that thing out. So pretty much you're stuck with, uh, okay, so I got to draw the ink up and spit it back out. Draw it up, spit it out. Now some of the pens, um, not the Lamy, but some of the pens you can actually remove the nib unit like some of the Pelican ones. I know the M200, you can unscrew that nib unit and get that out of there. Maybe kind of soak and clean that out. That's easier. And then once you have the nib unit out, then you can just kind of, you know, flush easily and maybe even Q-tip swab inside the body of the pen. That makes that super easy. So then your piston mechanism is still intact, but you can kind of get up into the pen from the front end once you take the nib out. Of course, you got to determine if you're comfortable doing that with some of your pens. Some of these pens, you know, these fixed piston pens get up there in price. So you'll have to judge that one. But that is my recommendation there. Carla S. on Facebook. So now I have bent my third nib. <laughs> oh, Carla. Uh, one on a Metropolitan by dropping it. One on a Safari by sending it through the laundry. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, and now another one on a CP1. I've replaced the ones on the Safari and the CP1, but I guess that's not an option on the Metropolitan. Any tips on straightening a nib? I would love to be able to save the Metropolitan and avoid $13 each time I kill a Lamy nib, which I'm sure will happen. Well, Carla, sweetheart, <laughs> you gotta stop. You gotta stop doing this to your pens. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm really sorry for you here. Um, so yeah, you're right. The Metropolitan, there is no cheapy replacement nib for that. You know, the whole pen itself is 15 bucks. A Lamy nib is 13 bucks. You're almost getting a whole new pen for the price of just the nib. But I understand how that's frustrating because it's like, you know, you would think, okay, if the nib bends, I can just bend it back. And, you know, honestly, sometimes that works. Usually it doesn't though. You're talking about stainless steel here. This stuff's pretty hard. And those tines, the tines of those nibs really gotta be aligned pretty precisely. So if you're actually physically bending it out of shape, to bend it back to where it's flowing properly and writing smoothly, that's gonna be tough. I'm not even that great at doing that and I've messed around with quite a few nibs. So I usually don't recommend that. I mean, at that point, what have you really lost? You know, go ahead and give it a shot. You know, grab a pair of pliers and just do whatever you can with it. You know, if you can use just your fingers, great. Uh, but you know, pen, you know, nib guys, they have specialty tools and specialty tricks for this kind of stuff. You know, little hammers and pliers and things like that that they use. I don't even really know exactly what they are because I don't have a lot of nib expertise in that respect repairing stuff. So, um, you know, there's some other pens though. The Metropolitan, it fits the Plumix nibs, it fits the Penmanship and the 78G. Both of those pens are ones that I don't carry because they're not imported through Pilot USA here in the US. Um, so those ones, I, I know the Plumix is $9. So it's a, it's a stub nib. So. It's a different kind of nib, but it's it's an option. It's cheaper than a Metro. Um, the Penman 78G, I'm not sure about those. I think they're cheaper, but uh, 78G, I think, might even be discontinued, so I'm not sure. But th those might be options for you, too, if you can find any of those. Um, and then my last recommendation to you is, okay, so this is kind of going a little bit of a different route, but if you want cheap nibs, okay, Noodlers just came out with a non-flexible $2 number six size nib, which will fit in the Noodlers Ahab, the Conrad, and I believe you can jam that thing into several other different pens. Um, I'm not gonna say which pens now because I represent several manufacturers and some of them don't like me to officially say that you should use another brand's nib in their pen, but let me just say you can do that with certain other pens. So then if you drop it, it's a $2 Noodler's nib, you can just buy like 10 of them and you can kind of always keep some on hand for when you inevitably are gonna do that again. 
Nikesh J on Facebook said, <clears throat> Habit Noodlers Conrad and Ahab cleaned them out overnight, if you can believe it, to get out the machine oils. Inked them up and worked fine. Now, sometimes the ink flows and the pen writes, and then very quickly it stops after it was working so well in one sitting of only a few minutes. Are there still oils restricting the ink flow still? Also used soap. Okay, so you did the right thing by cleaning it out. The machining oils, I think, was more of a problem early on. It's not as much an issue these days. However, that's still a good route to go. It's honestly not a bad idea to go ahead and do a cleaning, at least a little dish soap, maybe some pen flush if you've got it around. Um, do that with any new pen that you get because there could be machining oils and small bits of debris and stuff on any new pen. I'm talking $500,000 pens too, okay? So it's not just Noodler's pens, it's really anybody. But the Noodler's, because their feeds are made of ebonite, ebonite is a little more um, porous material than plastic feeds, which is what is on most other pens. So that feed in particular sometimes needs a little extra cleaning than some of the other pens might. Um, so the first, that, yeah, it could be the oils, you know, but it sounds like you clean it pretty thoroughly, especially if you use soap. That's usually not a problem. If you've got any leftover soap in there, that could be part of your problem. So you got to make sure that you're getting out any of the old soap. So if you're cleaning it out using kind of dish soap or a pen flush or anything like that, don't make that your last step. Make sure you're cleaning it out with fresh water after you do that step because soap will restrict the flow. Okay, um, it could be something completely unrelated to that. It could be a pen and ink combination issue. It could be, you know, uh, an adjustment issue because those pens in particular, as I mentioned earlier, can be a little bit finicky. So you may have to adjust the nib and the feed in the pen to kind of get it to where it's flowing properly. Um, those are some of my suggestions. And then lastly, um, you may want to try heat setting the feed to the nib. Okay, that's relatively easy. I'm actually going to be coming out with a video on that soon. I've been thinking of this video for a long time, but the concept is very simple. Heat up some water in a coffee mug to just below the point of boiling. Stick the feed in the nib that are sitting in the pen in there, not dunking the whole pen in there, but just the nib and the feed in there. Leave it for, you know, 10 seconds or so. That'll heat up the feed. It's ebonite, so it'll become soft. It's a rubber material. So it'll become soft, and then you can just kind of touch it and push it up to the nib. Not squishing it, but just push it up there, and it'll bend and kind of heat itself, um, flex right to the, the nib, and then that will fix most of your flow issues. So lots of different options for you there. Uh, a couple questions left. KDB on Facebook. Are buying used fountain pens a good way to go if you're looking for something specific without the initial cost of a new pen? Or does that lead to problems because you don't have any guarantees from a company and the pen might need servicing? Okay, so I debated about answering this question here uh, because this isn't kind of really a pen maintenance question, except you're asking about used pens. The maintenance of those pens can be important. And this is kind of a question that I've never really gotten before, so I felt like throwing it in here. So buying used pens. I do not have a lot of experience buying used pens. I've got some, some vintage stuff, but I do not. that's not how I got into the hobby. So I personally did not feel that was the best route for me to go. However, that is a route that a lot of people go, especially if you're into vintage stuff. You know, vintage pens are all used pretty much, unless you're getting NOS, new old stock. That's a term you might see every now and then online. Um, unless you're getting new old stock, you're pretty much getting a used pen. Maintenance is really important for how well that pen is gonna work. So a lot of people don't realize that maintenance is important and may have been using that pen for 20 years or 50 years and never cleaned it. So you could be dealing with issues with replacing parts or the sack inside the pen if it's a vintage one that has a sack. Um, and you, the, the cleaning regimen that had been used all that time becomes really important. So it really gets to be a crapshoot if you're getting some older stuff and you have to kind of know a little bit what you're looking for. Um, pen flush helps out tremendously in that respect. That's kind of like what it's made for. Um, if it needs servicing, yeah, that's going to be tough. So if you're going to a pen show or something where you can actually write with the pen, that helps a lot because you can see that the pen is performing as it should. If you're buying something on like eBay or Fountain Pen Network or some other forum or whatever, that gets a little tougher because you got to kind of trust that whoever you're buying it from is not scamming you or isn't just selling off some pen that hasn't worked well for them that they're trying to pawn off that may be out of warranty or they just bought from some other sketchy dealer. So you got to use, you know, what I call 
call um, you know, your own discretion. Caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. You really got to exercise a lot of that when you're buying used pens, especially in like auction type scenarios. Um, but that said, it is a cool, is it a cool way to get um, some pens that maybe are discontinued or that um, or would be out of warranty anyway, or just, you know, you might be able to get a good deal on them. So it's really kind of, you got to use your own discretion, your own comfort level. The more you know in that situation, the, the better off you'll be there. And uh, as is always the rule, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. If somebody's got a Pelican M1000, they're selling for $4, probably something wrong with it, okay. Uh, Jeffrey G on Facebook, the converter in my Lamy Safari is apparently not sealing nicely. Is there a way to disassemble the converter to get the silicone grease on the piston? Yes, it is a little tough though. However, if you're at the point where it's not working well anyway, what have you got to lose? Worst case, it's a $5 replacement, right? So there's a sleeve, a metal sleeve on the back of that converter. And I've never done a video on taking apart a Lamy converter, even though I've been thinking about it for like four years now. but. Maybe I'll get to that, okay? No promises. Uh, but anyway, I'll explain how you do it. So it's got a metal sleeve that holds the back of the mechanism onto the plastic part of the ink chamber. That sleeve slides off, not easily, but it can slide off. Um, I've had to resort to pliers before to make it happen, but it does slide off. When that sleeve slides off, the back of the mechanism pulls right out. You can grease the thing up, stick it back in there, slide the sleeve back on, and you're good to go. Should only take you a couple of minutes. And once you take it off for the first time, it'll be easier to take off times after that. So give that a shot. Whew. Okay, last question here. Adam SW216 on Reddit said, when you have a large collection of pens, how many do you keep inked up at once? I would imagine having them all inked up with something could lead to a couple getting neglected and drying out. You are absolutely right. I've talked about this in previous videos, but um, I don't know if I've ever given you a specific number for how many might be good to keep inked up, which is why I put this question in here. So me personally, I have a large collection and I leave pens inked up and they dry out all the time and I get annoyed with myself, but you know, busy guy, two kids, business, it happens. So I don't sweat it too much. I just get very used to cleaning out very dried up pens a lot. I use a lot of pen flush. So, um, yeah, it's really going to depend on you and how often you want to clean them and stuff like that. Uh, I've definitely been in the habit in previous times when I had all my pens inked up and I did not feel like cleaning them. So I will just kind of shove them aside and ink up a new pen. Of course, then that's only making the problem worse. <laughs> I will still have to clean out all those pens, except there's more that I'm going to have to clean out. So I literally have a bin of... I'm looking at it on my desk right now, probably 40 pens right now that I need to clean out. It's pretty terrible. So that's, that's, that's an extreme case. Don't let it get to that point. So I recommend three to five pens at a time, okay? Of course, you can use your own discretion here, but I think three to five pens is good to get enough variety of ink colors, nib sizes, and so on. Uh, and then you are not going to run into a situation where you are forgetting what ink you put in your pen or that happens to me a lot, or that you are inking up so many pens, there's no way you can use them all, and then they're just gonna dry out because you just kind of forget that you have some inked up. So um, what I <laughs> do in theory, in practice doesn't always work this way, but I keep a small like a uh, um, you know pen case or a sleeve or roll or a couple of pen pen slips or something that I'll have all my inked up pens, and then all my clean pens I will kind of keep stored away a little bit more, and I'll kind of separate out the clean ones from the inky ones. When I start to mix the clean and inky ones, that's where it gets really confusing for me because I don't remember what I've inked up and what I haven't. And then when it comes time to grab a pen, I'm like, oh, this one's dry. Okay, oh, this one's, oh, oh this one's empty, but it needs to be cleaned, you know? So then I have to go through and kind of go through my entire collection and say, okay, what do I need to clean out? That's why I have a bin of like 40 of them now. Is it's like, okay, I just went through them all. I was like, okay, I don't know what's cleaned and what's inked and can be used and what had ink and is now dry and needs to be thoroughly cleaned. So so I'll go through in one sitting and kind of pull them all out and check them and stuff like that. But that really gets annoying. That's kind of just like as a result of my own bad pen habits. I'm not a perfect person, okay? I know a lot about pens, but I don't necessarily take my own advice. So three to five pens tends to work really well. Whew. There. Uh, yeah, that was great. A lot of good questions. Okay, so that's it. That's all I'm going to do for today. But man, you guys, you guys are sending me some great stuff. Seriously, I'm loving it. Okay, uh, for next time, 
um, the theme, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. Normally I do like, you know, theme, open forum, theme, open forum, but I'm going to skip the open forum next week because I'm excited to launch into a new little branch, a new little avenue with Goulet Q&A here. I'm going to start going with themes by brand. Okay, so next week is going to be February 7th, 2014, and I'm going to start with Lamy. So Lamy questions, if you got questions about pens, ink, whatever else that you've ever heard of that is Lamy, and I've got a couple surprises for you next week, some things you may not have seen. So uh, Lamy questions, if you got any questions about Lamy, lots of different ways that you can get those to me. So. First thing I'm going to recommend is that you subscribe here on YouTube because I do lots of cool stuff. If you're watching this on the podcast, subscribe to the podcast. So that way you will get all the videos and stuff that I put out because, you know, I put a lot of time and care into these and it'd be great if you could get them automatically by subscribing. So there's that. But if you've got any questions for next week, okay, so I think you should either hashtag me on Twitter, Goulet QA. Uh, you can send an email to uh, GoulayQA at GoulayPens.com. You can post on Facebook. We will pose the question. We'll remind you probably like Tuesday next week um, asking for questions about Lamy. You can also do the same. We may do the same kind of thing on Reddit. We've got a lot of good questions on Reddit this week, so I uh, may do that as well. So kind of watch out for those coming up. Uh, you can also, what are the other ways? Oh, yeah, post a comment on this video on YouTube or on Ink Nouveau in the comments, and then I will see that and be able to possibly answer it. Can't promise I'll answer it, but I'll possibly answer it. So that said, I hope you have a wonderful week. Hope you enjoyed this week's Q&A, uh, and as always, right on.